shall rise up to pray. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer today. That the Bible study tonight will enrich your soul. That as we study, you'll be a real disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listening to Him. Learning from Him. Taking in the Word. Allowing the Word to transform your life and make a definite change. Turning around. In your life. Pray that the Lord will give you the heart of a real believer. Cleansed from sin. Transformed and turned around. With a decision and a purpose of heart. To follow the Lord through to the end. And at the people around you will see the grace of God. We'll see the seriousness, devotedness, yieldedness, the submission and the surrender of your life to the Lord. That in the secret, as well as in the public, in the family, as well as in your place of work, these things we study every week as we come will make such a tremendous impact in your life. The people will take knowledge of you that you are being with Christ. That the evidence of real salvation, evidence of true repentance, the evidence of scriptural righteousness will be seen visible in your life. That your profit by the study of the word and your neighbors that see you will profit by their interaction and association with you. Pray that the Lord will help you to have the same faith and faithfulness, the same commitment and loyalty, the same obedience and consecration as we find in the lives of these people, Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego that was studying in the chapter that we're looking at tonight. He helped them. He can help you. Whatever challenges you face, Whatever persecution, whatever opposition you face because of your commitment to the Word of God, the Lord has promised to help, and His promises are yes and amen in Christ. Trust him. He'll hold your hand. I will not let you fall into sin.
He did not fail those who trusted him in the past. He never fails. Neither will he fail today. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. He promises to hold our hands and he will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us to the Bible study tonight. Thank you for this good habit your people have formed. Of coming every week and listening to your word, being taught line upon line and precept upon precept. We pray, Lord, as we study tonight, we believe us all over. We're asking, O oh Lord, you're strengthening every one of us to demonstrate the light of the gospel you're revealing to us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, the same conviction and stability and steadfastness that you gave to the worthies of old, you give to every one of us as we study tonight in Jesus' name. The grace in them give unto us. The loyalty in them give unto us. The obedience, submission, yieldedness to the will of God that they demonstrated, give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, in times of temptation, trial, and persecution to stand firm, faithful to the Lord, to the very end, in Jesus' name. Bless us in the study of the word tonight. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down now. Once again, I welcome you to the Bible study tonight. The study of the Word of God is very essential, very important to pilgrims who are going to heaven. You know, there are people that say they are Christians and they do not give much value to the study of the Word. Those people will not have any backbone to stand at a time of trial, temptation, and persecution. They are half straw for backbone. And when the wind blows, when the rain comes, and when the troubles arise, they'll be blown off and blown down. They'll be blown off their feet because they do not have the spiritual stamina to stand. But it's those who meditate on the word of God. Those who take in the word of God. And those who feel challenged by these things that we read about these faithful worthies of old. And they take the same stand. And they stand firmly on these unchanging truths of the everlasting God. It's those people that are able to stand when temptations and persecutions arise because of the world. We're back to Daniel chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 3, we're looking at... Verses 13 to 18. But I'm going to back up to verse 8 so that those who are not here before will be able to see the connection. You'll know what happened and then you will understand very well what we have in verses 13 to 18. Now verse 8. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou king hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackboard, satry, and dual sima, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth, that, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fairy furnace. In verse 12, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury 
commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods? Now worship the golden image which I have set up now. If ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sounds of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbot, satry, dulcima, and all kinds of music, and ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a bony furry furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the, from the bony furry furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. That's the story we're looking at, or part of the part of the story. And it tells us about the faithfulness of these three faithful believers in the living God. It tells us about the godliness of these uncompromising three children of God. Nebuchadnezzar dressed up an idol, a great image, a massive image made of gold. And it had a great height and a little breath. The stature was imposing. And then he made a command and a decree and he said, Everybody, when you hear the kind of music, Babylonian Chaldean music, you'll fall down and worship. And then these three people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decided that as they had been worshipping God, as they had turned their lives to God, as they had committed themselves unto God, as they had willed, consecrated their lives and worship unto the Lord, and they had said they were going to serve the Lord and the Lord only in easy times and tough times, in difficult times and in delightful times. Every time they were going to serve the Lord, now the challenge came, they said, we're still going to serve the Lord. We're not going to worship any idol. And when the millions of people, when they fell down to worship the golden image, these three faithful believers, they kept on standing. I pray you all stand. And then some people, informants and psychophants, we call them, they went to report. And he said, do you know what has happened? That these three young people, they're not bowing down. They're not worshipping your image. And then Nebuchadnezzar called them and interrogated, investigated about it. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not worship my idol, which I've set up? And then he said, I'm giving you another chance. If you will hear the music, just because of you, will play that music again just because of you to give you another chance we're going to sound that chaldean music again if you hit the ground immediately you hear that i'll just overlook the foolishness of not bowing down or bending at the first time but if you refuse and you become adamant and you say you're still going to worship the god of israel in babylon who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand. And the man was furious. And then you know the answer they gave. They said, we're not careful to answer you. This battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. And so they refused to bow. You will not bow. You will not bend to the devil. And you will not bend to the people of the world. All that your study will give you backbone and stamina. And you'll be faithful to the very end in Jesus' name. 
I just want to tell you, it's not child's play to be a true believer, a devoted worshiper of God, and to be a true soldier of the cross. The true believer lives under the banner and the laws of his country, but the world expects him and wants to compel him to follow its rules. The God of this world is the devil, and he wants to claim implicit obedience. Satan sets up himself to be worshipped. If we would not worship him or his image, the fierce tyrant will remind us that the bonny furry furnace has not yet cooled. The devil will remind people, you must remember the past, those who said they were going to stand, persecution arose. And if you will say you are going to stand today, the devil is going to remind you that the fairy furnace is still as hot as ever. And then will ask you, do you have the same grace, the same strength, and the same power, the same conviction as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? If you say you will stand, and I throw you into that furnace of persecution, where will you be? To be a real Christian? You must decide to cast off the bondage of this present evil world. Your resolve, your decision, your determination must be taken to bear all consequences rather than worship the idol of the hour. The music of the world will sound. The threats of the prince of the world will be heard. But the true believer will disobey the evil one and obey God. You have to learn to say no to the devil. You have to learn to say no to the world. You have to learn to say no to the people who want to capture your heart and take your heart to themselves and then take your heart away from the Lord and from the Savior, from your Savior and Captain of your salvation. It's to which commends, uh, that which commends itself to your conscience as true and pure, you must do. But that which is false and sinful, you must quit with firm resolve and determination. The loyal subject of King Jesus will not try to serve God and mammon. And so they brought these uh, three believers, they brought them before the king. And see the question he asked in verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? Am I hearing well? Can that be real? I heard that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I heard when you hear the music, you did not bow down. Is that true? Are, are we dreaming here? Is this a mistake? Or are you just late for the hour? I'll give you another chance. And I give you this chance so that you'll make up your mind now. Look in that direction. The fire is burning. The furnace is hot. And anyone that gets in there is going to burn up. Are you going to just play with something like this? Can this be true? That's what he will ask you. Johnny, is it true? I sent you to go and buy that alcohol. Is that true? You don't want to buy? I forgive that foolishness. Rise up now and go and buy that thing very quickly. Your old sin partner will ask you. I called you. You need to answer. I heard that you are going to a new church now. And in that new church, they tell you this kind of thing. No boyfriend, no girlfriend. Is this true? The other time I sent you to go and uh, get some bribe and then share 50% for so and so, 50% for you. And I heard that you said, you don't take bribes anymore. Is this true? In the market, they, tell, they say that everybody should contribute money for idolatry. And then they came to you and you're not contributing your own. Is that true? Am I hearing well? Is this true? In your school, you young people, they'll say they're contributing money so that they can find the exam paper. And then you say, I'm a Christian. I'm standing for righteousness. There's no corruption in any part of my life. Is that true? They're going to ask you the question. They're going to challenge you. Are you really taking your stand? Are you going to be the isolated fellow? Are you going to stand like that? And then they'll tell you, this is what will happen if you don't bow, if you don't bend. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, is it true? The tyrant asked for a reaffirmation of their resolve. 
Would they reconsider and change their decision? Or were they ready to prove it true at the very expense of their lives? In his hands lay their liberty and their lives. That's what he thought. He said, I can set you free and I can bind you. I can burn you up or I can release you. Your liberty, your life is in my hand. In his hand lay their progress and their prosperity. He was the one that employed them. He was the one, he was their emperor. And it was almost all in all for everyone. He was the one that gave Daniel Shadak, Meshach and Abednego scholarship to study. And then he gave them job after they finished the study. In his hands lay their happiness and their hopes. He was their benefactor. He was their employer. He was their emperor. He could not believe that anyone could disobey his orders. We must be ready to answer without any hesitation or fear that it is most certainly true. Whatever you have heard that we said, we vowed, we consecrated, we yielded to the Lord and we said we're not going to worship idol. That's what you've heard. It is most certainly true, O King. We're not going to worship your idol. You will not worship idol. You will not compromise. Whatever they do, however they act, and whatever pressure or threats they may bring upon your life, here is your decision, firm, clear, and plain, that you will not compromise. The grace of God will be with you. As we look at the study, we're going to divide to three parts. Number one, the ruthlessness of the persecutor of persevering saints. The ruthlessness of the persecutor of these persevering saints. Number two, the resolution and perseverance of persecuted saints. Resolution. Determination, decision, the firmness that here is where you stand and nothing, not even the threat of Nebuchadnezzar will change your mind. The resolution and the perseverance of persecuted saints. Number three, the reckoning and the persuasion of persecuted saints. What did they reckon? What were they persuaded of? They were persuaded that if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning furry furnace, and he will. I said he will. He will deliver us. There's nothing to fear. God Almighty, whom we serve, is greater, higher, more powerful, mightier, that 1,000 million Nebuchadnezzars, and the Lord is able to deliver, He will deliver in Jesus' name. Welcome to point number one. The ruthlessness of the persecutor of persevering saints. In Daniel chapter 3 verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up now. If ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornage, flute, Harp, sackbot, satry, and do simmer, and all kinds of music. Ye fall down and worship the image which have set up well. But if ye worship not, if ye worship not, if ye want to be the holy, holy people, if ye worship not, if ye want to prove holier than thou, and you think you are better than everybody else, if you worship not, if you exalt your own faith and the living God above the practice of everybody else, if you worship not, if you want to be in the minority, the majority of people are falling down, they are worshipping, and they are complying, and they are yielding to the temptation of the hour, and the challenge of the day is bending their backbone. They are not able to stand. If you want to remain in that minority that will not 
bent or bow to my idol. If ye worship not, ye shall the same hour. Because into the midst of a burning furry furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? That's not the first time we're hearing a question like that. Nebuchadnezzar is not new. Pharaoh asked the same question. Who is that God? We heard that before. There's nothing new under heaven. All these threats of persecution. All the threats of great pressure. All the threats of the enemy. The persecutor saying, if he doesn't bow, we'll burn him up. We'll destroy him. We'll get rid of him. It's not new. We've heard it before. And our God has always prevailed. And he'll still prevail. I said he'll still prevail. There's nothing new that the enemy is going to do that he has not done before. And he has tried it before and failed. If he tries it again, he will fail. We're looking in at Exodus chapter 5, verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Go. They've said it before. That's Pharaoh. But Pharaoh perished with all his chariots in the Red Sea. And the same thing today. Anybody that tries to bench the will of the children of God to their will, wanting to, wanting to get them go astray, go away from the Lord, and wanting to claim what belongs to the Lord unto themselves. The Lord is still able to deal with them like he dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. Well, persecution is there and persecution will come. But in persecution, by the grace of God, you will stand, I will stand. And wherever the persecution is coming from, sometimes they come from church goers, religious people. Sometimes it comes from idol worshippers. They have the religion of their own. Sometimes it comes from the people who are pretending to love you. And they say, we love you so much, we don't want you to be in a religion like this. Being saved and sanctified and living a righteous, a pure life. And you are totally different from everybody around. We're just trying to help you. That's why we're putting the pressure on you so that you will change. Wherever the persecution is coming from, I pray the Lord will help you and assist you, lift you up and make you strong in your conviction in your heart. You will stand in Jesus' name. In John chapter 15 verse 18. John 15 verse 18. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. That's the principle we should never, never forget. You are not the first one to be hated by the people of the world. If you are not bending to the rules of the world, if you are not worshipping their idol, if you are not drinking their alcohol, if you are not smoking their cigarette, if you are not sewing their clothes, and if you are not wearing their jewelry, if you are not following them to their nightclub, if you are not giving the bribe, the want, the demand, they will hate you. If you're different, if you do not love the world and you give your heart unto the Lord, they will hate you. And Jesus said in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But their hatred doesn't do anything against us, we still go stronger, still go higher, and we'll see the perfect will of God in spite of the hatred of the world. I will remain strong in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. And you know what they were trying to do, or what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do, was to stop Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from their conviction 
And to say, all right, we're sorry, we'll be following the narrow way that leads not to life eternal. Now, because of this threat and because of this persecution, we're going to turn around and then follow the broad way of the majority. Never do that. Because if you do that, then the promise of God will never be with you. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they had bowed to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar because of the threat and because of the furnace of fire, the testimony... And the miracle and the great mighty exploit that we read about in Daniel chapter 3 will never be able to read that. It's because of the standing firm in that hour of temptation and trial. That's why you find the miracle here. And if you will stand, you too will have a miracle. In Acts chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The thousands of believers in Jerusalem, persecution came. And this persecution made them to be scattered abroad. What does that mean? They lost their jobs. They lost their houses. They lost all conveniences and they were driven here and there even though they were scattered away from their home, away from their residence, away from their places of work, away from everything they held dear. They didn't allow that scattering to change their minds. They still stood and they stood firm. You all stand. In verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, and committed them to prison. Look at verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? Did they abandon their conviction? Did they say no more church? No more Christianity? No more Christ? No more uncompromising stand? I practiced it. I got saved. And then persecution came. Ah, because of that persecution, I can no more go on in the way of the Lord. Did they say that? No. Look at verse 4 again. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They stood. We can stand. Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11 verse 19. Now... They which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. The reason is that that's the language they understood. They understood the Jewish language and they made use of the language they understood. And they were preaching the word to those Jews. And some of them were, were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Did persecution stop the power of God? Did persecution stop the partnership with God? Did persecution stop their anointing and the unction and the authority they had in Christ? No. The persecution didn't do anything negative, but in the persecution, they became stronger. And they became more determined. They were, they were going to serve the Lord until then. That's why it says in verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar's call to idol worship was universal and non-negotiable. The command extended to all people without exception. The penalty for refusal was death, that is painful death in a furnace of fire. His full tyrannical authority was behind the edict of this supreme dictator. The threat to force every, was to force everyone to become fearful and forsake their character and forsake their conviction and forsake their creator. That's always the purpose of the persecutor. To make you lose faith in God 
and to make you lose your honor for God, your obedience to God, and to crush your will so that you're not bent down to them. They want you to make them God. They want you to fear them instead of fearing God. They want you to worship them instead of worshiping God. They want you to bend and bow to their law instead of bending and bowing to the law of the Almighty God. In short, they want you to make a little God of them. And if you bow to them, then you are exchanging God. You are making a little human being who is going to die maybe tomorrow. You make him God and then you forsake the eternal God. But Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said, we're not going to do that. Your persecution is not going to make us forsake our character, forsake our conviction, or forsake our creator. What a lamentable sight to see all those people except the faithful few bend and bow to the will of tyranny. The creatures of God were forced to worship a creation of man. The persecution was a fairy persecution, a fairy trial of their faith. But their faith was strong to neutralize the fear of fire and to remain steadfast and unmovable. I pray you'll be steadfast and unmovable. They were strong in their commitment to God and they would rather suffer than sin. That's very important. They knew that if they didn't sin, they knew they would suffer. Persecution brings pain. The pressure brings pain. The difficulty, they knew that will bring some real danger of suffering. But they decided we have to make a choice either to suffer or to sin. And rather than sin, we choose to suffer. And suffering is nothing because it's temporary. It's only for the hour. It's only for the moment. It's only for today. It doesn't last very long. But if you sin and you try to avoid the suffering of today, then you're going to suffer eternally. But these people, they said, would rather suffer now than sin. They were strong in their commitment. In that same way, we're going to be strong. Uh, in the early church, there was, uh, uh, there was a case that you know, I've written here on the outline. Uh, this man was faithful to the Lord, and the emperor of Rome called him and threatened him. And he said, I'm going to banish you. If you remain a Christian, to banish means I'm going to send you on exile. And he said, me, thou canst not banish. For the world is my father's house. He said, anywhere I am is home. And it doesn't matter where you send me. I'm still going to feel at home. Then the emperor said, but I will take your life. And then he said, no, you cannot take my life. Because my life is seed with Christ in God. And then the emperor said, I will deprive you of your treasures. Then the believer said, I have no treasures here. My treasure is in heaven where my heart is. And therefore you cannot seize my treasure. Then he said, I will drive you away from men and you will have no friend left. He said, no, you cannot do that because I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. You see that man replied the emperor. The emperor did not know what to do with him because he took his stand. That's how we're going to take our stand. And whatever they say, whatever they do will not affect us because we're going to stand for righteousness all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. In First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 verse 19. For this is sunk worthy. If a man for conscience toward God and dear agree, this is praiseworthy. This is thankworthy. If a man because of conscience, if a man because of conviction, if a man because of his association, interaction, relationship, fellowship with the Lord, if he says, here is where I stand. If he suffers because of that, he sank what the suffering wrongfully. In verse 20, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, he shall take it patiently. But when ye do well and suffer for it, when ye do well and suffer persecution for it, it says, and then you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. You see, in life, if you take a stand 
and you face the right direction. The people who don't love that, that stand, that steadfastness, that righteousness, and that firm commitment to the Lord, those people are going to bring persecution. But if you stand through it all, the Lord will know that you really mean to worship Him. And then the persecution will not bend your will or bend your character. You'll be standing till the very end. It tells us here in verse 21, For even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye shall follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In such a situation, all you do is that you commit yourself unto the Lord. And when you commit yourself to the Lord, will he fail you? Will he disappoint you? He'll see you through. He'll hold you up. And then great will be your reward when you eventually get to heaven. Even from the earth here. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It says it's not just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's, it's not just Peter or Paul. It's not just the believers of the early church. Everyone, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What does that mean? All. You are made in the house. And then you are a believer now. You take your stand. Your master, your mistress, they're going to tell you something to do if it's contrary to the will of God, to the word of God. You'll say, no, I cannot do that. No, I must not do that. No, I will not do that. I'm going to take my stand for the Lord. You'll suffer persecution. You're a student at school. And then you see the other young people. They're going in the wrong direction. And they're following the, play, the pattern of the world, the pattern of corruption. And the pattern of compromise. If you're a real believer as a student, you're going to take your stand. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are you a wife at home? And then you are born again, but your husband is not born again. Or he says he's born again, but he's not standing on the word of God. And when friends come, he wants you to serve alcohol. He wants you to do this or that. He wants you to be worldly. And you made up your mind. Not to allow the things of the world to bend your will to the will of the world. You'll suffer persecution. Are you a husband? And then your wife is not a believer. She might be a church goer, a Bible reader, a Bible carrier. But she goes to a kind of church. But she doesn't stand on the word of God that demands righteousness, purity and holiness. She's going to wonder, how is it to like that? And you'll suffer persecution. Are you a child at home? And then you want to take your stand. And daddy says, do this or do that. And you know that is not according to the word of God. Respectfully say, daddy, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ and his word forbid me to do that. Persecution may come in verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are you an employee? That you are working in a place. Your employers may demand that you do something unscriptural. Something that is not righteous. Something that is not truthful. And to change this and change that so that you'll be able to tell the customers this or that. And you know it is not right. And you say, no, I cannot do that. I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I walk by the principle of the word of God. Persecution will come. Are you an employer? Are your employees will demand that you compromise and change? Don't you know what they do in other places? Other employers, what they do? Why don't you do that? You say, no, I'm a Christian. I've given my life to the Lord. And I, I base the work, the employment here on the principle of righteousness and holiness. You're going to suffer persecution. Look at it again. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Yea, yes, truly. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Then it says, but 
continue. We will continue. I said we will continue. When the pressure comes, when the fire it gets hot, when it heats the furnace threefold or sevenfold or twentyfold, whatever, and when the threatening comes, that you know, here is where a child of God ought to stand. When everybody frowns at you and frowns at your stand, and you say, no, I'm going to take my stand, you will continue. The grace to continue, the Lord will give to you in Jesus' name. In verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We're looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 1. One nine. In Psalm one one nine, we're looking at verse eighty six. Verse eighty six: All thy commandments are faithful; they persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. It says, "I'm not willing to bend, Lord. I need your help. I'm not willing to change, Lord. I need your help." I'm not willing to bow or bend to the God of this world. Lord, I need your help. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon earth. But I forsook not thy precept. Verse 88, quicken me after thy loving kindness. So that I shall keep the testimony of thy mouth. And then in verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The doctrine of God doesn't change. The teaching of God's word doesn't change. The requirement and the demand of the Almighty God doesn't change. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. And then he tells us in verse 92, Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget thy precepts. I pray that will be your conviction. And that will be your decision. That will be your determination. When temptations come, when trials come, when persecutions come upon you, you will say like verse 93, I will never forget that precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. Verse 157. 157. Many are my persecutors and mine enemies, yet do I not decline. From thy testimonies. Then we're looking at Psalm 143. Psalm 143. From verse 3. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness. As those that have been long dead. Therefore... Is my spirit overwhelmed within me? My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse that still meditate on the work of thy hand. That means when those persecutions arise, when those difficulties arise, when those dangers arise, you'll not be meditating on the pain, you'll not be meditating on the suffering, you'll not be meditating on the fire, you'll not be meditating on the heat, you'll not be meditating on what you're losing, you'll not be meditating on their frowns, you'll be meditating on the work of God, on the watch of God, the demand of God, and the reward that is going to follow if you stand faithful to the end. In verse 6, I stretch forth my hands unto thee, my soul all thirsteth after thee, as in a thirsty land. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. In the midst of the temptation, the temptation will likely you know, affect your way of thinking. I see it may be, I should find an easy way out. That's why the psalmist is saying, when the persecution is tough, 
And when the fire is very hot, and when the threatening is terrible and intimidating, he says, oh Lord, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. For I lift up my soul unto thee. In verse 9, deliver me, O Lord, from mine, en- from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will. Teach me to do thy will. I pray you'll do the will of God. At such a time when the pressure is on. At such a time when the temptation is great. At such a time when the trial is very high. That at that time you'll commit yourself still to doing the will of God. Teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. We'll come to point number two. The resolution. And perseverance of persecuted saints, the resolution, the determination of persecuted saints. You know, if you don't have, if you don't have determination, if you don't have a resolve, if you don't have a determined will, a determined mind, you see, the persecution will likely bend you and move you. To just surrender your mind, your will, your heart, your very life unto the enemies of righteousness. But it is when you have a resolve and you are resolute about it and you are determined about it and you persevere. I say it doesn't matter. The fire will not burn forever. This one is made by man. This one is not eternal. I will stand in this. Even if it burns you down. Then you say, I'm going to stand to the very end. You will stand in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 16. The resolution and the perseverance of persecuted saints. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not worried. We're not anxious. We're not panicking. We're not fearful. We're not intimidated by your threat. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. Never allow worry and anxiety in your life. Whenever those persecutions come, whenever those pressures come, you should be able to say, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. The battle is not between you and us. The battle is between you and the Almighty God. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Don't panic, just pray. Don't be fearful, just have faith in God. And don't be overmuch careful, timid, trembling, because of what they do, or because of what they say, or because of the look on their faces. Or because of the violent words coming out of their mouth. Because of their threatening. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and by supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. In verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep thy hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Say good amen. Amen. In First Peter chapter five, First Peter chapter five, reading from verse seven. First Peter five, verse seven. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Hey, don't try to deal with the furnace of fire by yourself. Don't try to deal with the threatenings of Nebuchadnezzar by yourself. Don't try to deal with the persecution of, of the persecutor by yourself. Don't try to deal with the fears and the fury of the persecutor by yourself. Hand everything over to God, casting all your care upon the Lord, for He careth for you. But looking at Isaiah chapter 51 verse 12. Isaiah chapter 51. Reading from verse 12. Here is a question the Lord is asking us. 
And the Lord is wondering why we're so timid, why we're so fearful when He has, when we have Him in front of us and behind us and around us, beneath and above. When we have Him surrounding us everywhere. And we know He's mighty and powerful. And no human being can successfully oppose His power. He says, why are you so fearful? In Isaiah chapter 51, we're looking at verse 12. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou? That thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass, and forgettest the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day. And has feared continually every day. That means they were not no more looking up to God. They were no more looking at the promises of God. They were no more counting on the faithfulness of God. They were no more checking up on the testimonies of the children of God. What God had done for the others in the past. They were not no more looking at the great wonders of the Almighty God. They were looking at the power of their enemy. They were looking at the threatenings of their enemy. And then it says, "You have feared continually." Only every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Where is the fury of the oppressor? Let, let uh, Pharaoh come and tell us, where is the fury of, of uh, Pharaoh? And let uh, the Philistines come, let Goliath come. Where is the fury of that Goliath? And let all those enemies of the people of God, let them come, Shinakerum and Arabshaki and all the other people that fought against the children of God. As we look at the end of the story, where is the fury of the oppressor? Now we're looking at Nebuchadnezzar. Where is the fury of Nebuchadnezzar? And then you look at Herod in the New Testament. Where is the fury of the oppressor? Why don't you meditate on the destruction and the defeat and the damnation of those enemies of progress and the enemies of the people of God in the past. And understand, the same God that they served is the same God we're serving today. It says, I'm God, I change not. And the same Christ, the captain of their salvation, is the captain of our salvation today. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Where is the fury of the oppressor? Meditate upon the word of God, upon the promise of God, upon the power of God, upon those testimonies we have heard in the old, old in days then there will be no fear in your heart and then you'll be able to stand and you will stand till the very end in jesus name because god is on your side and he says whatever the persecutor in, persecutors intend to do you will stand you will take your stand and then like the lord helped the people in the early church the lord will help us acts of the apostles chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 17 Acts chapter 4, verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us strictly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Look up here, brothers and sisters. Christ had given the great commission to his own disciples and apostles. And at this time now, they were just in Jerusalem. And Jesus had said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then to the uttermost part of the earth. They were just in Jerusalem. They had not crossed over to Judea. They had not witnessed Samaria. And the gospel had not gone into the uttermost part of the earth. And now they said, let us threaten them straightly. Strictly, seriously, sternly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. The point is this. If they had yielded to the threats or threatenings of those members of the Sanhedrin and they had stopped there, the gospel would not have gone beyond Jerusalem. If they had listened to them, if they had been afraid, if they had been timid, if they had been crushed by the power of the persecutor, the gospel would have remained just in Jerusalem. Because that's the intention of those people, the powers that be, 
that the gospel will not spread. The same thing today. The gospel has come to you. And if you listen to the threats or the threatenings of the persecutors, it will not go beyond you. But once, if the Lord wants you to take it away from Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. If you will crush, if you'll be crushed, and then you'll crumble, and then you'll be crawling under the boots of the persecutor, and then all your decisions, they're cancelled. Because of the persecutors, the gospel will not go beyond where it is now. It is by refusing to yield to the threats or threatenings and to the persecution of those persecutors. That's how those who are not saved yet, that's how they will get saved. And they are going to get saved. I said they are going to get saved. Look at verse 18. And he calls them and commanded them not to speak at all, no teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were not going to yield. You are not going to yield. We're looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 27. Acts chapter 5, verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest and asked them, asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you? Did we not sternly command you? Did we not seriously command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I want you to still notice, it was still just in Jerusalem. Just in Jerusalem. That's what the people of the world want to do. They want to just crowd you in. They want to limit you. They want to put so much pressure upon you that you'll just be fighting for survival. You'll not even be thinking of going to other communities, other countries, other places because the persecution is to stop you where you are. So that this word of life, this gospel of the light of the word of God, and this word of life eternal will not go beyond where it is now. And then that's the strategy of the enemy. They have failed, they will continue to fail. Uh, but you know, in, in you know, your personal life and in your family, as you see the persecution that may arise for that individual, for that, or maybe for you, and then the intention of the persecutor is that where the gospel has reached now, that should be the limit. Should not go beyond this. And so the persecution coming in various ways. Or oh, just say, stay where you are. Don't go beyond that. And all we do now is, you know, just to come into our local church and then be limited to just where we are. Praying, God keep us, God help us, just to stay here, not to lose the faith, and not to, uh, not to be crushed under the boots of the persecutor. And then about evangelism and going out, we forget all about that because we're even praying to even survive. But the Lord is saying, it's not just to survive, we're going to spread. And we're going to go to the places where these people, where they say we should not go, we will go everywhere. And the persecutors, whatever their threatening, they will not stop us in Jesus' name. It tells us in verse 27, I'm reading again, and when they have brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest and asked them, saying, Did we not straightly, strictly, sternly, seriously command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to be God rather than men. Can we say that together? We ought to be God rather than men. Can you say that by yourself? 
Will you say that again? Thank you very much. Some of those men are mighty men. Some of those men are terrible men. Some of those men are magical men. Some of those men are tyrannical men. Some of those men are wicked men. But whoever they are, I ought to obey God rather than any man on earth. And the Lord will give you the conviction, the courage, and the strength, and the power to carry out that declaration and proclamation in Jesus' name. We're looking at First uh, Peter chapter 4. In First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye sh- we may be glad also with exceeding joy, if ye be reproached for the, for the name of Christ, appear ye. That's a form of persecution, reproach, ridicule. Insult, abuse, calling names, making jest of you. That's verse persecution and his sin. If he be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. They call you bad names, terrible names, dirty names. And they insinuate that you think you are righteous and holy. And then they say some opposite things, some unprintable things about you. It's persecution. Don't misunderstand. All they want is to be able to make you so sad and sorrowful that you know they are suspecting you that you are this bad. They are suspecting that you are this dirty. And they are trying to tell you that you are not as righteous as you thought you were. All that is just to persecute you and depress you. But it says, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any suffer as, as what? As a Christian, not as a criminal, not as a backslider, not as a false prophet, not as a deceiver, not as a covetous person that took other people's money, but if any suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The three Hebrew Christians, or Hebrew children, these three faithful worshippers of the living God refused to worship the image of the king of Babylon. Unafraid of the king's fury, and unintimidated by the terrors of the bony fairy funnies, they refused to give up the worship of God for the worship of the golden image. The king was fierce in his persecution. And they were firm in their purpose and principle. They had insulted their God. And they must defend God's glory with their very lives. They were willing to render unto Caesar the things which are God's. They said worship belongs to God alone. And we're not going to give unto Caesar what we must give unto God. They were ready to part with their lives rather than part with their conscience or conviction. Notice that they were ready to part with property, with position. They were ready to part even with their lives, lose their lives, rather than lose their conviction, their character, or their conscience. They were captives in Babylon, but their souls were not in captivity to the God of this world. God has forbidden his people to bow down. To any idol, and no reasoning can make that right which God has said is wrong. As God's command is plain and direct, so our obedience must be plain and direct. This example of heroic steadfastness teaches us that we must always say no when we are tempted or threatened to do wrong. The believer 
who has pledged, committed, consecrated, surrendered his heart and life to Christ, is resolved and determined to serve God at all times. Whoever is pleased or displeased, the truth has arrested him. And he knows that the love of God and the love of the world will no more mix than oil and water. He stands for truth and righteousness. He refuses even to parley with iniquity. Of such brave determination and resolve, we shall be able to endure the trial of the hour. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four. And we're reading from verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 13. It says, We have in the same spirit of faith with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Having the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might be through, might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. We faint not. Are you fainting? Will Nebuchadnezzar make you to faint? Will the persecutors make you to faint? Oh, the persecutors are watching. They're watching your reaction. They're watching your attitude when they threaten you. And when they try to put a pain or pressure on you. They're watching whether you will faint and whether you will just fall down. Whether you will give up your conviction. They're watching. But if you will not faint, even your courage will terrify them. For which cause we think not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at things which are seen. But are the things which are not seen, but the, or the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's what happened to Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They say, yes, you can see the furnace, that's temporal. We can see the fire. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's what sustained them. That's what will sustain us. We come to Daniel chapter 3 verse 17. Daniel chapter 3, we're looking at verse 17. And if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fairy furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. That was the reckoning, the reckoning of faith. That was the persuasion, the persuasion of faith. If we have faith in God, the promises of God will be yes and amen for every one of us. In Romans chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 4, verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. They knew the promise of God. And they did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. They were strong in faith. And they were giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that that which he had promised, he was able to perform. What is it that the Almighty God had promised? That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were depending on. What is it they were trusting in? What is it they had confidence in? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, we're looking at verse 2. The promise of God, they were reckoning on. The promises of God, they were standing on. The promises of God that they knew. God has made the promise and is able to fulfill the promise he had made. In Isaiah 43 verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, notice that, not when thou runnest, you are not in a hurry, he that believeth shall not make haste. 
You're not really hurry that, you know, this will be over in a minute, in a moment. Your walk, it says, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? Look at verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Because of that confidence that this is what God has promised. And they knew that whatever God has promised, he was able to perform. That's why they were holding on. That's why they were holding fast. In Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 11. Second Timothy chapter 1. Verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is, is what? What? He is able. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. And that's what, what Abraham, that's what he depended upon. That what he has promised is able to perform. And that is what Paul the Apostle, that's what he's saying here. That's the affirmation of his faith. He said, I know, I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. On the basis of that, now he tells us in verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus that good sin which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Don't let the persecution, the pain, the pressure, the threatness of the people knock out the truth from your heart or from your hand. That good thing which has been committed unto you, you hold it fast even by the Holy Ghost who dwells in us. The Lord will help us. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, we depend on the strength of the Lord at a time of persecution. When the pain is terrible, when the pressure is great, we depend upon the Lord to keep us and to see us through. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 13. And again, I will, I will put my trust in Him. And again, behold I and the children which God has given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The power of the devil is destroyed already. He cannot go beyond the limits the Lord has said. And the persecutors, they are not as powerful as Satan. They are not as powerful as the devil. If the Lord has crushed and conquered the power of Satan, how much more the power of those uh, spirits and people that are less than Satan. He has destroyed them and they will remain conquered and defeated in Jesus' name. In verse 15, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but took, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things he befitted behoved him that to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them, to sustain them, to support them that are tempted. Our God is able. Hebrews chapter 7. Verses 25 and 26, Hebrews 7, verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. is reminding us and reassuring us that this our God is able. 
That whatever persecutions may come our way, and whatever trials may come our way, that our God is able, wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's actually on the, on the right hand side of the Almighty God, and He's praying for us in verse 26 For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And that's why the worthies of all, the people of all, that's why they depended upon the Lord, because they knew that our God is able. And He'll see us through the affliction, through the persecution, through the difficulty. And we shall not fall, we shall not backslide, we'll stand firm to the very end in Jesus' name. In, uh, sec- in uh, Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 18. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Would you say that for yourself? And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work. And will preserve me unto his everlasting, his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's why you are not afraid. That's why the persecution of the people, of the persecutors, will not stop your onward journey. Now, as you look at Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, the Lord wants us to have the same conviction and the same steadfastness and the same stability of faith that these Hebrew children had. These uncompromising believers refused to bow to the king's unrighteous demand because they were sustained by unwavering faith in God's promises. And the Lord wants us to look at those promises. Always to stand on them. Don't look at the faces of the persecutors. Look at the promises. And don't, don't listen to the threatenings of those persecutors. Look at the proclamations of the promises of God. When we believe that God will make all things work together for our good. When we live in constant obedience to the Lord. And leave the outcome of all events in His hands. No sevenfold heated furnace of persecution is hot enough to burn up the conviction of a true child of God. Understand that the devil is after your conviction. It's after your stability. It's after your steadfastness in the Lord. And you want to stand. You don't want to throw away your conviction, your stand, your steadfastness. Just because there's a nakedness in front of you. All the fury and the power of the most tyrannical persecutors cannot burn up the deep-rooted truth of God's word from our hearts. If we trust in his grace and his power to keep. Whatever God calls you to do or to suffer, fear not to obey, He will be with you. In whatever He calls you to, He will never let you down. If He calls you to enter the fairy furnace, hesitate not for one moment. He will be with you either to sustain you or to deliver you or to make you conducive to your higher good and future glory with courage. With determination, we must act in the light of eternity. We must not judge any situation by the king's threats or by the heat of the bony fairy furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life awaiting us. These three concourse stood their ground against sin, and they dared the rage of an infuriated persecutor because they saw him who is invisible. And they had respect unto the recompense of the reward. We must constantly live in the reality of the future, or we will miss the chief fountain of holy strength. The overwhelming power of their faith dominated their hearts. In times of emergency, their faith sprang to the form and asserted itself. Faith made them fearless, made them courageous, made them persevering. They knew that God's will, not the Cadenza's will, God's will will prevail and God will be glorified. In your life, God's will will prevail. And God will be glorified. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 31. Romans chapter 8. Verse 31. What shall we say then? 
to these things. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? What's he doing there? Who maketh intercession for us. And God always answers the prayer of Jesus. And he's praying for you that you will not fall. That your faith will not fail. That in the midst of persecution, you stand firm and faithful to the very end. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, and we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. In all these things I am more than a conqueror. Through him that loved me. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In Jude verses 24 and 25. Jude verse 24. In Jude verse 24, here is the assurance. The Lord who has saved us is able to keep us. In a time of trial, at the times of temptation, persecution, tribulation, whatever, the Lord will keep us faithful to the very end. Jude verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Can he keep you from falling? And to present you faultless. Before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And let's see, as God held these three Hebrew children, even though Nebuchadnezzar threatened, even though he made up his fire to be very hot, seven times hotter than before, yet the stood. Now think about it. Whatever persecution you're experiencing today is not as much as this. There's no fairy furnace. There's no fire. Nobody is binding you up. Nobody is throwing you into the fire. Just a little frown. Just a little insult. Just a little difficulty, just a little challenge, just a little denial, just a little pressure. If they could stand such great pressure, by the grace of God, we can stand. And you know, in all the little, little things we're going through, if you fail and falter, and if you fall, and then you give up the faith, because of these little, little things, in eternity, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will condemn you. They will say, but we stood the fire. And you could not stand a little pressure. If they could stand, we will stand. Daniel chapter 3 verse 15 now. If ye, if ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the carnage? Flute, harp, sackboard, satry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Ye fall down and worship the image which have made well. Are you ready to fall down and worship? Are you ready to compromise? Are you ready to go back to sin? No. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fairy furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Who is that God? And then they threw them in. Were they delivered? Yes, they delivered that same Nebuchadnezzar said, Who is that 
God. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth, uh, to the mouth of the bony furry furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the most high God, come forth. Hey, I, I thought you said, who is that God? God revealed himself. In your situation today, God will reveal himself. When you go through persecution, God will reveal himself. When the pressures are great and mounting, God will reveal himself. When the Nebuchadnezzar makes his fire seven times hotter, God will reveal himself. You don't need to crumble. You don't need to get discouraged. You don't need to compromise. Because the persecution is to bring the glory of God in your life. While you are getting into it like this, God will show up. And the appearance of the fourth man, the son of God, will be with you. You'll never feel you keep on standing. Let's rise up and commit ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, we have heard your word. We're going to stand by that word. We're not going to allow the persecution, the pressure, the pain, and the fury and the rage and the anger of any Nebuchadnezzar of today. We're not going to allow that to hinder us from following after the Lord. We have made up our minds. We're going to serve the Lord until the very end. And no threat or threatness, no persecution or pain or pressure. Is going to make us to turn back. Give yourself to the Lord. And the Lord is able, able to sustain you. Able to keep you until the very end. Talk to the Lord in prayer. But you know, an empty bag cannot stand upright. We must not be empty of the grace of God. We must not be empty of the power of the Lord. We must not be empty of the strength of the Lord. It is when you are filled with the word of God. And your faith, trust, conviction on that word. Then whatever persecution comes your way. Then you will be able to stand. You must be born again. Is a new birth that brings Christ to dwell, to live within us. It's a new birth that makes righteousness to be the pattern of our lives. And it is that righteousness and holiness in us, the light of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, that the enemies are fighting. They don't want you to spread. They don't want you to go beyond where it is now. But you'll take your stand. And you say, Lord, I've declared my stand. I've declared my relationship with you. I'm going to stand with you until the very end. Commit yourself to the Lord. Wait on the Lord and thereby you'll be strengthened. Pray by that prayer and supplication. The strength will come into you. It's by that prayer and supplication that will be energized in your spirit, in your soul. It's by that prayer leaning upon the promises of God. That you'll be able to stand. You'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You'll be able to look at Nebuchadnezzar straight in the face. Without fearing, without trembling. There'll be no intimidation. You'll stand loyal, faithful, obedient to the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you are becoming weak because of the persecution coming upon your life. If you are losing ground because of the threatness of the enemy. If you are really failing and faltering. Because of what the enemy is trying to do. Today you can pray for more courage. 
more strength, more power, more stability, more steadfastness in the Lord. It will strengthen you. And then the light will be shining in the dark place, in the world where you go, where you go to work, where you live. Even though people may oppose your stand, you know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through much more, much more, much more than that. And you will stand. Without looking at Nebuchadnezzar, you'll not allow the fury, the rage, the threatenings of Nebuchadnezzar to bring you down. Stand for righteousness. Stand for the truth. Stand for your conviction. Don't allow these little, little things. Little, little trials, little, little difficulties, little, little temptations to bring you down. Those who went before us were faithful to the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't have all that we have. They didn't know all that we know. And yet they stood firm. They meditated on the word of God that they had heard. They meditated upon the promises of God. And they knew that Nebuchadnezzar was just a human being. We are not to fear human beings, whoever they are. We are not to fear them. The Lord said, don't fear those who can kill the body. And after that, they have nothing else they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you will fear. He says, fear God. Fear God. Who after he had killed the body, has power and authority to cast into hell. He says, I say unto you, fear him. Stand in righteousness. Stand in the truth. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, I need your power. I need your strength. I need your courage. I need your grace. So that I will stand faithful to the very edge. Yes, it will uphold you. It will not allow you to fail or fall or falter. If you will lean upon the Lord and lean upon the arm of the Almighty... Honor it, you are the everlasting arms. In times of trial, in times of testing, in times of temptation, you can stand and stand on the word of God, standing on the truth, and standing for the truth. And say, Lord, help me. The battle is raging, help me. The persecutors are threatening, help me. The persecution is getting tough. Help me. All that are fearing and falling. Help me. They are pointing to the examples of other people. And I saying, are you better than so and so? Are you better than so and so? He does it. He compromises. He gives bribes. He gives this and that. Even other so-called church members might come to you. We're hearing about you. You're too strict. You're too firm. How about this? How about that? You'll take your stand. That's why you're praying now saying, Oh Lord, when the challenges come, help me to stand. That's why you're calling on the name of the Lord. So that when your own time of temptation, of trial, of testing will come, You'll be able to stand. You'll tell the Lord today. Oh Lord, when that time arrives, help me to stand. And it will help you to stand. Yes, it will help you to stand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood. They stood the fury of the tyrant. The fury of the persecutor. You can stand. You are worshipping the same God. 
You are relying upon the same promises of the same God. He has never failed. And he will never fail. You can trust him. You can trust him. He will strengthen you more than those persecutors. More than those, uh, more than those persecutors. And more than those unbelievers. Yes, you can stand. Have a conviction and stand by that conviction. Be resolved. Be determined. Be fully yielded, surrendered, consecrated to the Lord. Say, Lord, when the enemies will threaten, when the persecutors will persecute, Lord, make me to stand. Like a real believer. A believer with conviction. A believer with purpose of heart. A believer who is not fainting. A believer who has set his mind, his face toward heaven. The persecution may come in any form, in any way. Pray that the Lord will give you the power, the strength, the ability to stand when that hour comes. And if you are in the midst of persecution right now, the pressure is building. The challenges are mounting. And others are watching you. We're going to see whether I'll be able to stand or not. Tell the Lord, it will soon be over. It will soon be over. But tell the Lord, at this hour, at this moment, when it appears your strength is going down, at this hour, at this moment, when it appears the devil with the persecutors are trying to have an upper hand, tell the Lord, make me stand. And he will. Yes, he will. Lay everything upon the altar. Don't worry what the enemy is trying to say. They'll take this away, they'll take that away. It will make life intolerable for you. Don't worry about that. Look unto the Lord. Look in unto Jesus the author and the finisher of your faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame of the cross. And he didn't mind the contradiction of sinners against him. Stand firm like that. And your faith will quench the violence of the fire. Are you standing? Your steadfastness will be an encouragement to other people. They will say, if Shadrach and Abednego and, and uh, Meshach, if they can stand, I can stand. They will say, brother so and so and sister so and so, if they could stand... All that fiery persecution and opposition against them. Then I can stand. Your steadfastness will be an encouragement to other people. They will say the same God that gave the grace and the strength and the power and the commitment unto so and so. He can do that for me as well. Let your commitment and your conviction, your courage... Your conquering spirit be an encouragement to other people and be firm in your commitment, be resolute in your determination to serve the Lord to the very end. Don't yield, don't surrender your heart, your will, your faith into the hands of the persecutor. Stand firm to the very end. 
will help you. He has never failed. Those who trust him. At the hour of trial, that's when you need him most. In the hour of temptation, that's when you need him most. Say no to the devil. Say no to the persecutor. And maintain your ground with that no. How many other people might be falling? Maintain your ground. And say no to that temptation. And don't allow the practices of the world to corrupt you. You have an heaven to gain. You have a hell to shun. To avoid. To escape. Say, Lord, help me. He will help you. And be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fairy furnace. And it will deliver us from your hand, O King. We will not serve your image.